good. Okay, do you have your script open? Mm-hmm. And are you are you ready to fucking rock? Let's fucking go! This is a very metal episode. <laughs> All right. Welcome to Ill Repute, a history of notorious women, where we explore the lives of notorious women throughout the centuries, from groundbreaking scientists to criminal masterminds. I'm Sovereign Sire, a writer, screenwriter, comedian, and former sex worker with a passion for history. I'm Ella Darling, a VR pioneer, former librarian, and amateur roboticist. Uh, who are we going to be discussing this week, Savi? This week, we're talking about Olive Oatman, a Mormon settler that was abducted by the Yavapai and later adopted by the Mojave before being returned to settler society. Olive published one of the most famous and popular captivity narratives of all time and is still captivating audiences. Her story has been borrowed from or directly adapted in numerous television shows, books, and feature films. The primary sources we'll be using today are Olive's original text, as well as The Blue Tattoo by Margot Mifflin. I want to prepare our audience. This episode is dense and will be broken into two parts to allow us time to really dig into Olive's story because it is exceptional. Also, I'd like to give a content warning at the top of the episode. We will be discussing a massacre with child victims, sexual violence, the extermination of indigenous peoples, as well as the Mormon religion. Because this episode relies on historical documents, there is some racially insensitive language directed at Native Americans. Where possible, I've tried to use the names of specific tribes rather than using terms like Native, Indigenous, or Indian. Where Indian is in place names or historical texts, I've retained it. Otherwise, I've used specific names for the peoples discussed. Should we get started? Actually, before we get started, should we explain what a captivity narrative is for people who weren't fucking English majors? <laughs> yes. A captivity narrative is a genre of literature that depicts the experiences of individuals that have been captured, imprisoned, or held against their will by a person or group. These narratives often focus on real-life events and offer firsthand accounts of captivity, though fictional captivity narratives also exist. The narrative typically begins with the capture of the protagonist, often in a sudden or violent manner. This event serves as a catalyst for the ensuing story. Once captured, the protagonist experiences a significant loss of freedom. They are separated from their familiar surroundings, family and friends, and forced into an unfamiliar and often hostile environment. Captivity narratives also involve a power struggle between the protagonist and their captors. The captors may subject the protagonist to physical and psychological abuse, while the protagonist seeks ways to resist, escape, or assert their independence. The protagonist must navigate the challenges of captivity, developing survival skills, and adapting to their new circumstances. This can involve forming alliances with other captives, learning the captor's language or customs, or finding ways to manipulate their captors. Captivity narratives also explore the psychological and emotional toll of being held captive. The protagonist may experience fear, trauma, despair, and a longing for freedom. These narratives often delve into the protagonist's internal journey and their attempts to maintain their sense of identity and sanity in a hostile environment. A common trope is the protagonist's quest for escape or their eventual liberation. This can be a climactic moment in the story where the protagonist overcomes obstacles and finds a way to regain their freedom. Captivity narratives often include moments of reflection and introspection where the protagonist contemplates their experience and draws moral or philosophical lessons from it. While captivity narratives have existed as a genre since the Bible, they became really popular during the 17th and 18th centuries in North America. This period coincided with the colonial expansion and conflicts between European settlers and Native American tribes, as well as the transatlantic slave trade. The colonization of North America and the encounters between different cultures resulted in frequent instances of captivity. European settlers, particularly along the frontier regions, faced the threat of Native American raids and warfare. These stories appealed to readers' fascination with tales of adventure, danger, and the unknown. The accounts of captives held against their will by unfamiliar cultures and landscapes offered an exotic and thrilling backdrop for storytelling. Many captivity narratives were imbued with religious and moral overtones. They often presented the captives as righteous individuals who endured suffering and hardships while maintaining their faith. These narratives reinforced religious beliefs and served as cautionary tales for readers, emphasizing the virtues of piety and the dangers of straying from the righteous path. 
Some captivity narratives were used as propaganda tools to further colonial interests. They depicted Native Americans or other non-European groups as savage and cruel, reinforcing stereotypes and justifying colonization efforts. These narratives served to both entertain and promote a sense of superiority among European readers. Captivity narratives have continued to be written and studied in subsequent centuries, albeit with varying degrees of popularity. I mean, one of my favorite modern day captivity narratives is Zola. Um, do you remember that? Oh, yes, but recap it. So it was a Twitter thread about a black stripper's essential abduction by a white stripper and the chaos that ensued. The thread was eventually adapted into a screenplay and turned into one of the most buzzed about movies released over the pandemic. It was directed by Janik Sabrava. Zola, that film was an incredibly uh, trippy film to watch. Uh, <laughs> but let's talk about Olive Oatman. Okay. So Olive Oatman was born in 1837 into a Mormon family, not long after the Mormon church had been established by Joseph Smith, which is really weird because I tend to think of the Mormon church as being older than it is. When I think of this story in the context of the fact that this religion that her parents were following had been started just a few years before she was born, it makes it even crazier when we get into the rest of the story to really, sort of keep that in mind. It's the America of Christianity. It's the like, you forget when you go to Europe that like, oh, wow, this McDonald's is older than my country or Mormonism. <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. Uh, we have to get into some background about the Mormon church to understand the circumstances around which the Oatman family decided to leave Illinois and head out west. So this this is kind of a little primer just on... One of the bigger emigration patterns that happened in recent history, which was the Mormon emigration to the West. So Joseph Smith was born in 1805 in Sharon, Vermont. In the early 1820s, he claimed to have a series of visions and spiritual experiences culminating in an encounter with God the Father and Jesus Christ. He said he was chosen as a prophet to restore the true church of Jesus Christ. In 1830, Smith organized the Church of Christ, later renamed the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in Fayette, New York. The church quickly grew and faced persecution and opposition from various sources due to its unorthodox beliefs and practices, most notably polygamy or plural marriage. In the same year, he wrote the Book of Mormon. In 1839, just a few years after Olive Oatman was born, the LDS Church, which is what I'm going to call it from here on out, settled in Nauvoo, Illinois, where Joseph Smith served as the mayor of the city. During this time, Smith introduced doctrines such as baptism for the dead, plural marriage, and the concept of exaltation. Exaltation? I've never mm -hmm. heard that. I know, me either. That's why I was like, <laughs> let's talk about it. <laughs> I feel like one of these things is not like the other. What on, yeah. what on God's green earth is exaltation? So understanding why Mormons were viewed as other comes down to these three beliefs, baptism of the dead, plural marriage, and the concept of exaltation. So I figured we should just get into what those are so that people have a frame of reference for the shit show that is about to ensue when these people get on the fucking road together. All right. Um, so... In the context of the Mormon Church, baptism for the dead refers to a unique religious practice where living members of the church are baptized by proxy on behalf of deceased individuals. This ordinance is performed in Mormon temples. Uh, the belief behind baptism for the dead stems from the Mormon doctrine that emphasizes the importance of baptism for the remission of sins. According to their teachings, baptism is a necessary step to enter the kingdom of God. However, the church also believes that not everyone has the opportunity to hear the gospel and be baptized during their mortal lives. To address this issue, Mormons perform baptisms for the dead by standing in as proxies for the deceased individuals. They believe that the souls of the deceased can choose to accept or reject the baptism in the spirit world. It's important to note that Mormons do not believe this practice forces the deceased to accept the gospel or the baptism, but it provides them with the opportunity to choose. Mormon members gather genealogical information about their deceased ancestors and relatives to perform these proxy baptisms. The church maintains extensive genealogical records, and they encourage their members to research their family history to identify those who have not been baptized and offer them the opportunity through this ordinance. So 
I mean, <laughs> I promised I was not going to laugh at Mormons because I'm not about mocking people's religious beliefs, but <laughs> that is some wild shit. You see, that's like, this is... I, I, that's a step away from Jay-Z Knight. I mean, so continue. Been done in other cult- I feel like this is like something that the catholic church did at some point or i don't know it just feels very i mean i mean the catholic church sold indulgences and like i mean in in the catholic church you have sainting right people can be sainted and and you can't be a saint while you're alive it's something that has to happen after you're dead so that would be an example of something sort of similar sainting is um instead of a nobel prize yeah Sorry, that was yeah. a joke. Um, I get all of that. Uh, it's just, it just feels like I think it sounds really ridiculous, but I am also an atheist, so it all sounds a little bit batty to me. But like, it just seems like a new flavor of crazy that isn't that far off from the other flavors I've heard. Just this one little chunk. I'm not saying as a whole. This one little nugget. Well, I'm just like, this just sounds like an MLM boss bitch yourself into the fucking sun kind of tactic. I mean, talk about expanding your numbers. I've done a lot of research on my family. I can trace my family all the way back to the 1500s. And a lot of those records are held by the Mormon church. And so if you've ever wondered why or you've heard that the Mormon church has the biggest ancestry archive, all of that kind of stuff. This is why. Yeah. But it's a very like MLM kind of thing to do. It's very giving like Lululemon vibes. You know, surely you must know like 30 people that would be interested in selling these leggings. Mm-hmm. And then you could be, I'll be your upline and then, then you'll be my downline and then you'll get your own downline. <laughs> <laughs> like, like an MLM. I mean, it ruins your life and it does kind of fuck up your entire your entire social circle and alienates you from your friends and family in similar ways. But Yeah. Um, I don't know how, like, I, I made a couple Brigham Young jokes. So, like, you know what? It's kind of hats off. Like, we're, we're going a little ham on the Mormies. Okay. Okay. <laughs> ham on the Mormies. Is that- <laughs> <laughs> That's my favorite brunch item to order. <laughs> Moon over my, my Mormies. <laughs> Mormies over my hammies. Moons over Miami. That's what we're talking about. Moons over my hammy, right? The that's the joke. Yeah, it's the but it's just right in orange juice. Yeah. <laughs> Exaltation refers to the ultimate goal of human existence and the highest degree of glory that individuals can attain in the afterlife. It is closely linked to the doctrine of eternal progression, which is a core belief in Mormonism. Uh, according to Mormon theology, God, who is referred to as Heavenly Father, desires to share his glory and blessings with his children. Exaltation is the process through which worthy individuals can become like God and inherit all the divine blessings he has to offer. This includes the potential to become divine beings, create and govern their own worlds, and have eternal life in the presence of Heavenly Father and Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Uh, do you so so what they're saying is that when you die and you go up into heaven uh-huh. and God is there and he says, I want to make you a God and you can have your own world that you're in charge of. Your downline? Yeah. It's an MLM. You were not fucking around. You weren't sure. Yeah. It's a spiritual pyramid scheme. Wow, this is this is so, but so easy to see in a religion. So, so you understand why when the Mormon Church was founded, why people didn't like Mormons? These beliefs that sound crazy to us sounded just as crazy to their contemporaries that were Baptists or Catholics. This sounded crazy. This sounded like a cult. It sounded made up and antithetical to a lot of other Christian doctrine. This idea that you would get your own world to rule over and to a 19th century farmer person, that seemed a little uppity, just Seems a little bit. blasphemous, doesn't it? And it's, I mean, humans, uh, yeah, a little. put yourself in the level it's, of... It's a little aspirational. Of Heavenly Daddy... I found one of my ancestors, a census card, and it said occupation, and it said, just a farmer. 
<laughs> that is the most conspicuous shit. What kind of drugs were they running? Just a farmer. That was the ethos of the era. You didn't have aspirations. So uh, I think there was a lot going on around Mormon beliefs. But this idea of being able to have your own world is is really going to feed into kind of settling and immigrating and, and finding a, a new place to establish the Mormon religion and kind of create its own state, sort of it's yeah. a mirror as above, so below, that kind of thing. That is interesting. Wait, is that a thing in, in Mormonism? Because that's a thing in Satanism. <laughs> it is. Yeah. That's I don't know anything about religion. Uh, oh, as above, so below. Yeah, that's like uh, on a lot of the Baphomets. That's also a religious principle, which yeah. is that the earth is a reflection of the heavenly kingdom, that kind of thing, which is, I think, actually where that comes from. Yeah. So, um, I but didn't think anyway. The Satanic Church that some like hot topic goth Gen Xer founded 20 years ago or whatever was the originator of that one, probably. <laughs> But um, I just think it's crazy that God thinks they can handle having whole worlds, but can't handle like having a Coke Zero because of the caffeine content. Like, well, caffeine. be in be in the world, but not of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So. So the belief in exaltation is founded on several key doctrines in Mormon theology. Divine potential. Mormons believe that all humans are spirit children of God and that they have the potential to become like him through faith in Jesus Christ, obedience to his commandments, and following the principles of the gospel. Eternal marriage and families. Mormons believe in eternal families. Through temple ordinances, marriages can be sealed to last beyond death, uniting families together in the afterlife. This sealing is considered a necessary step to achieve exaltation. Temple ordinances. Mormons believe in performing sacred ordinances and temples, which are distinct from regular meeting houses. These ordinances include proxy baptisms for the dead, eternal marriages, and other rites that are believed to be essential for exaltation. Celestial Kingdom. Mormons believe in different degrees of glory in the afterlife. The highest degree is the celestial kingdom, where exalted beings dwell in the presence of God. This kingdom is seen as the ultimate destination for those who achieve exaltation. For religion, it seems really focused on the heaven part. Yeah, yeah. Like really, like, like granularly. This is like scientists in the 16th century building orreries to show the different uh, sections of heaven. Back in the day, they used to have these very elaborate three-dimensional winding machines. I, how would you, like an orrery, how would you describe that? It's it's a tooth and cog wheel design that you turn a crank and it would make all the planets spin around at their orbit. But they would, since they didn't know what the universe was like, what they were postulating was like the different layers of heaven. Okay. And so it would like kind of move them all around. And so it was a thing you could crank it by hand and it would kind of put this, it would put the entire cosmos into motion. And a lot of scientists would have them. You can buy them on, they sell them on Amazon now. I mean, they're still kind of just like a fun, kitschy thing to have in your house as like home decor. But they used to take the um, topography of heaven very seriously. And so it's very reminiscent of this idea of the degrees of heaven, what happens in this place, the different the different orders of angels, you know, this this really kind of... I mean, it is sort of like an MLM where you, I'm a tier five star princess. <laughs> I'm just I'm just trying to get to tier three unicorn. Seems very similar. So I'm calling this is a spiritual MLM. I think you called it. <laughs> Exaltation is not viewed as a given, but as something that individuals must actively strive for and be found worthy of through their choices and actions in this life. Mormons believe that all individuals will receive some degree of glory and blessings in the afterlife, but exaltation represents the highest and most coveted state of being in their theology. Well, I should say. So it's pretty grand. Here, here have your own world. I'm just imagining, you know, like that episode of Black Mirror, some net neck beard lost in a VR headset, just making people dance around and do their bidding. And the idea of giving people their, their own worlds, it's it seems like a very kind of um, dubious thing to strive for. It seems like striving to achieve a state wherein you become a god mm -hmm. is is a little little spiritually threadbare. 
a little bit. Yeah, God complexes are not usually something that you like. That's not a compliment, typically. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, a lot of this stuff is just part and parcel of pretty much every religion, which is do good acts, be faithful, you will be rewarded in the afterlife. It's it's not that wildly different, but some of the doctrine gets a little weirder and we'll get into that later. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, baptizing the dead is already kind of a little weird. A lot of the sort of thought problems that people would have with Catholicism or baptism is you have a baby and the baby dies before it can be baptized. Does that mean it's not going to heaven? And for a long time, the Catholic Church was like, yeah, no, they're in limbo. Yeah, Sorry. I you know, so it seems like in a lot of ways you can see how it's like a bunch of patches to fix perceived problems in the other established religions. Or it's anticipating these things. Baptizing the dead doesn't strike me as weird because like any weirder, I guess, than the concept of baptism to begin with, which is if it's your religion and you grew up in it, it makes complete sense and it's normal. But were you bathed in the blood of Jesus? I was not. I remain (laughs) heathen to this day. So doing that for the dead, especially like in a circumstance like you said, where, you know, a, a mother lost their child. And as far as the Catholic Church says, your baby is fucked and it, bummer for them. Anyway, onwards. Um, I don't know. Well, I, yeah, because people would ask those thought questions. What about people that haven't been able to hear the gospel? Like when they die, do Cherokee people that had not heard the has anyone that was that was born before Jesus Christ? Did they all go to hell? Like, you know, there were these kind of thought problems when you're dealing with any religion. As soon as you start thinking, you start having problems. So, right. right. Yeah. But I guess the other part of it, I mean, as someone who is sort of in a place of grieving right now, I kind of understand why people would reach for something like that when you're worried about like, where are they right now and you miss them and, and you're just trying to make sense of a situation that is sometimes like senseless and just feels like it is something that will drown you. I feel like something active like that, something that you are proactively doing that you think in your heart of hearts is doing some measure of good for them, especially if you think that you're like connecting with them, even if you're not having a conversation with them. I guess I just could see why this would help someone who's like really grieving if this is sort of their flavor. Um, yeah, I'm just I'm not going to yuck this particular yum because it doesn't sound that crazy because it's religion and all religion is. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. No. And I also see the point of like an eternal marriage, you know, if someone loses a spouse and is devastated, that feeling that they would do something that would guarantee their marriage in heaven could be by the same, would serve the same function psychologically. It would just create comfort and, and also ceremony, you know, people need ceremony around stuff, you know, we're, we're, we're all animals really. So we need ritual too to earmark things. I know it seems like a digression here, but I am the queen of context and I think it's important to understand what people believed and what was going on in the world around them to better understand their stories. So that was the Mormon church. So now we're going to jump back to Joseph Smith. So remember Joseph Smith started the religion in New York and then moved it to Illinois, to Nauvoo, where he was the mayor. So that's a little scary. Like, mm, eh. It's like, uh, like a spiritual monopoly, right? Yeah, um, yeah, not really. <laughs> yeah it's a, a little culty, you know? I mean, but hey, 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 you know, high control groups can be fun for some people. That was 1837, which is like around the time that Olive was born was like when he moved to Illinois, became the mayor, et cetera. Mm-hmm. So a few years later in 1844, Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram were arrested on charges of treason and inciting a riot after they destroyed a newspaper press that was critical of the Mormon church. They were incarcerated in Carthage jail in Illinois while awaiting trial. On June 27th, 1844, a mob attacked Carthage jail and Joseph Smith was shot multiple times and died at the age of 38. Here's the thing. The 1800s were very fucking metal. (laughs) People weren't taking any shit. If he needed killing, then that's what you did. It was very much, if you can make it, if you can cash the check that your ass just wrote, then you can do whatever the fuck you want. But if you're not bulletproof, guess what? (laughs) 
you can't roll into town, become the mayor and have your own fucking cult where the guys are marrying multiple women and they're raising the dead and they're baptizing dead people. You have to see how they were perceived by the locals, which is who the fuck are you and what kind of weird shit are you doing? Yeah, I mean, the plural marriage thing was very, very, very no, no ma'am, no ham. That alone was like it was prostitution. It was sex trafficking. Some people felt very, very strongly about this. So this is helping us to understand why there was this drive to emigrate away, to go settle some new place, because these kinds of problems were what was happening. Riots. And the Mormons were really fucking aggressive. They destroyed a newspaper press because the newspaper press was critical of their religion. So it wasn't like they were these passive persecuted religious people. I mean, they were gloves off. They were going in and destroying buildings and property. Yeah. I mean, you know. they were, their religion was flirting very hard with the government aspect, and they basically took a shit on the fourth estate. So, I mean, yeah. it pits off everybody all at once. Yeah, exactly. So that's just giving you some background in what the culture of the Mormon religion was like at this time. I'm sure that I have Mormon subscribers and I'm not, I'm not, I'm talking, I meant those other assholes, not (laughs) Not you. you, not you. We're talking about in the beginning at the foundation of this religion, it was very new and shit was wild. It was violent and it was, uh, rambunctious and it was caustic and it was very controversial. Following Smith's death, leadership of the church was initially disputed. Eventually Brigham Young, no pun intended, emerged as the leader and led the majority of church members westward to what is now Utah, establishing Salt Lake City as their new headquarters. This led to the formation of what is now known as the mainstream LDS church. So like I said, I meant those other assholes, (laughs) not you. Um, my Mormon listener. Is his name Brigham Young? I thought it was Brigham Young. Oh, I, a- I probably, I I probably wrote wrote it because that was. Oh, okay. I just always said I've just always said Brigham Young because they like to marry children. So I okay. So I, not not you. Those other assholes. Yeah. Not you. Not you. Generalized Mormon that's listening to this podcast. I am not talking about you. Like I have so much respect for you. We're talking about a different church at a different time. You're very upstanding. I mean, look, you're listening to us. You're so evolved. I just had a moment where I was like, did I did I forget his name? I never wanted to learn it in the first place. One of the factions that developed in contest to Brigham, to Brigham Young was a young preacher <laughs> named James C. Brewster. In 1837, the year that Olive Oatman was born, Brewster, who was only 11 years old, claimed to have had prophetic visions and with the help of his family became a missionary and developed a following. These followers were known as the Brewsterites or the Brewsterite Church. He was an early follower of Joseph Smith and believed that he was Smith's rightful successor. Let me just stop right there. What year was this? 18... 1830, 1837. So an 11-year-old, with the help of his family, became a missionary. An 11-year-old developed a following. An 11-year-old. What are we doing here? <laughs> I feel like that's what they do on YouTube now. Okay, so he's 11. Yes. And... He believed that he was Smith's rightful... Okay, so when Smith is still alive, he's like, hey, hey, dad, I'm your heir to this whole... Yeah. Okay. So while while Smith was alive, he was out doing all that missionary work, and he was like a child revelator. This was back in the day when you didn't call it channeling, right? And people would listen to you, and, and he was able to get followers. So uh, he was doing that, and then... When Joseph Smith died, which was 1844, so that would have been eight years. So he would have been like 17 when Joseph Smith died, and he thought he was the rightful successor, which was a problem because a lot of the Mormon church thought Brigham Young was the rightful successor. So this led to some issues. Some controversy. 
Yeah. Well, Brewster and his followers believed that the LDS church under Brigham Young had strayed from the original teachings and practices of Joseph Smith. They considered themselves to be the true continuation of the original Church of Christ and rejected the authority of Brigham Young and the mainstream LDS church. The Brewsterites believed that their leader held the divine authority to receive revelations and lead the true Church of Christ. So him and uniquely him. Yes. And all those other fakers were fucking loser haters. Yes, exactly. Like the LDS Church, the Brewsterites accepted the Book of Mormon as a sacred text. They believed it to be an authentic record of ancient American civilizations and viewed it as an additional testament of Jesus Christ alongside the Bible. The Brewsterites, like early Mormons in general, held millennialist beliefs. They were not like our millennials, like me, I suppose, refusing to buy houses, check, because they went bankrupt buying avocado toast. Ugh. So sad. These millennialists anticipated the imminent second coming of Jesus Christ and the establishment of Zion, a utopian society governed by the divine principles. The Brewsterites also rejected plural marriage. Good marketing. <laughs> It's important to understand these beliefs because they had everything to do with why the Brewsterites and the mainstream LDS church migrated to the West. There was great opposition to the Mormon church. Basically, like no one has ever liked these folks. The plural marriage aspect of the religion was and is still considered scandalous, though back then the practice of marrying off children to old men, not so much. Uh, I had many relatives that I found that were married off at like 13, 14 um, back in Tennessee. So you know, well into like the early 1900s. That was not like the craziest part. Really crazy? Hold up. Minimum marriage age in the United States is, I want to say 13. I feel like it's 12 and it's in Arkansas. Is it? All right, but I don't know. That's like today though. Like that is absolutely yeah. a new day. Uh, yeah, 12, ranging from 12 to 17. So getting married at 13 back then... I mean, we can talk a lot of shit, but maybe we should change some of our current laws and make it so that that's not possible today anymore. Oh, we really should. Uh, the main reason that it's now legal for children to get married is in the case of pregnancy to allow or to force the man to take responsibility for his child or both of them, ha ha ha, bring him young, no pun intended, led his people to Salt Lake City, Utah, specifically because it was kind of a shithole. It would discourage interlopers and the landscape would allow them to build large fortifications against strangers. Brewster, on the other hand, wanted to lead his people to a genuine utopia. So the Oatman family were Brewsterites. Now, I know that seemed like a long way to get around to there, but I just feel like in order to understand this story, the personalities and the conflicts that happen and how Olive handled what happened to her, you have to have an understanding of the environment that she was raised in and the core beliefs that her and her family held. It's, it's like a necessary evil to really kind of get in there and dig around. I don't like having to talk about religion, so it really took everything out of me to bring this information to you guys. And if everyone already knew it, then I guess I'm just stupid. I know none of it, <laughs> none of it at all. I did not know that Bruce Straits were a thing. I'm already learning as we go. I don't know. Side note, I do not open the script document until we record so that I don't have spoilers. So I'm learning just like all of you are as the show goes on. So I'm, I'm thrilled and excited. That's what I love about it. <laughs> Okay, so in 1848, Brewster, who ran a publication called The Olive Branch, a newspaper, posted an ad looking for other saints, which is what Mormons call each other, interested in following him to the promised land. Brewster claimed that he'd found a passage in Esdras, a text purported to be from an ancient Hebrew prophet, that the land of Bashan was to be found at the mouth of the Colorado River. He had not been there and described it as fertile, temperate, and wooded. He got this information from a travel log by an early explorer who had also never actually been there. If he'd gotten his information from, I don't know, a map, he would have seen that he was headed for a desert. The same travel manual described the natives as friendly. This was very different from Mormon doctrine, which was very, very, and I cannot emphasize this enough, very racist. The 1830 Book of Mormon described two warring tribes that both immigrated to North America from Israel. 
The Nephites were white and fair, and the Lamanites were dark and loathsome. Say less, Joseph Smith, say less. Wow. According to the Book of Mormon, the Lamanites used to be white, and once saved, would return to being white. I know, it's a lot. Strap in, because we're going to the 1850s. Woo, I see it already. <laughs> this is not fun. <laughs> Yeehaw. <laughs> Howdy, folks. Olive's father, Royce Oatman, was one of the saints who answered that call. Royce Oatman was born in 1809 in Vermont and raised in western New York. When he was 19, he moved with his parents to La Harpe, Illinois, where they opened a hotel. There, he married Mary Ann Sperry, who also came from a moderately wealthy, educated family. They spent a few years farming before Royce opened a dry goods business, which went belly up in 1842 during a run on the banks. He moved the family to Chicago for a year before moving them back out to another farm in Fulton, Illinois. In addition to being a farmer, Royce was also a preacher. While traveling around Illinois and Iowa, he claimed to have healed several parishioners and decided when he saw the ad in the Olive Branch that he was being divinely called to help establish this Brewsterite utopia. The Oatman family was large. Royce and Marianne had seven children, and she was pregnant with their eighth child when they sold everything they owned, bought supplies, cattle and wagons, and headed for independence, which was actually the name of the town, Independence, Missouri, to meet with the other Brewsterites ready to settle in the land of Bashan. In 1850, several wagon trails were utilized for westward migration and transportation across the United States. The Oregon Trail was one of the most well-known and heavily traveled wagon routes in the 19th century. It stretched from Missouri to Oregon's Willamette Valley, covering approximately 2,000 miles. Many pioneers used this trail to seek better opportunities and settle in the fertile lands of the Pacific Northwest. The California Trail branched off from the Oregon Trail near present-day Idaho and led to the gold fields of California. Thousands of gold seekers known as 49ers traveled this route in search of fortune during the California Gold Rush. The Santa Fe Trail connected Missouri to Santa Fe, New Mexico. It served as a vital trade route between the United States and Mexico, primarily for the transport of goods. Traders used this trail to exchange for Mexican products like silver, furs, and other goods. The Brewster Party met in Missouri and took the Santa Fe Trail, which would take them from Independence, Missouri to Santa Fe, New Mexico. From New Mexico, they would take the newly opened Southern Immigrant Trail, which was a significant decision. The Southern Immigrant Trail was an alternative route for immigrants traveling from the eastern and southern states to reach California and the western territories. The exact course of the trail varied, but it generally followed a southern path across Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona before eventually connecting to the California Trail or the Gila Trail in present-day Southern California. The route was advantageous as it avoided some of the harsh terrain and potential conflicts encountered on other trails. The trail's challenges including traversing vast deserts, river crossings, and encounters with Native American tribes who inhabited the region. Water and supplies were often scarce along the route, posing additional hardships for immigrants. The Southern Trail had been primarily used for military transport during the Mexican-American Wars, which had just ended when the Brewster Party set out from Missouri. Wow. Um, I'm pulling so, an image of that trail. So it starts in Santa Fe and comes down? Yes. Yeah. So basically it takes you from Santa Fe through Texas, like the panhandle, I think, and then Arizona. And then it kind of actually takes you through the mountains in like northern Mexico and then like back up into California. There's a lot of territorial shifts happening at this time. You're about to get into why this is a very new trail and not very well trafficked <laughs> and high conflict zone. It was, uh, it was not good. I'm excited to learn more. The Mexican-American War was a military conflict that took place between the United States and Mexico from 1846 to 1848. It was primarily a result of territorial disputes and differing visions of expansion between the two nations. The roots of the conflict can be traced back to the Mexican War of Independence in the early 19th century, which led to Mexico gaining independence from Spain. The United States had territorial aspirations, particularly in the lands that would later become Texas, New Mexico, Arizona, California, and parts of Nevada, Utah, Colorado, and Wyoming. Tensions rose as the United States annexed Texas in 1845, leading to a disrupted border between Texas and Mexico. The border between Texas, annexed by the United States, and Mexico was a contentious issue. 
Um, the United States claimed the border was the Rio Grande, while Mexico argued that it was the Nueces River farther north. In 1846, a skirmish broke out between Mexican and American forces near the Rio Grande, and the United States used this incident as a pretext to declare war on Mexico. I had to learn all of this in Texas history in seventh grade. This sounds extraneous. It all plays into what happens to this family. To say it was over, I mean, for some people, it was still ongoing because you have to keep in mind this is pre-news wires, things like that. So not everyone necessarily got the memo that the war was over when it was over, Right. you know? Right. So, and because it's a war-torn area, they're going to be a criminal element just hanging around. So the United States launched a series of military campaigns to invade Mexico and capture key territories. American forces under the command of General Zachary Taylor won several battles in Northern Mexico, including the battles of Palo Alto. Can you pronounce that? You're, you're from Texas. Uh, Resaca de la Palma. And Monterrey. General Winfield Scott led a later campaign that resulted in the capture of Mexico City, the Mexican capital. The Mexican-American War concluded with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo on February 2, 1848. Mexico ceded a significant portion of its territory to the United States, including present-day California, Nevada, Utah, Arizona, New Mexico, and parts of Colorado, Wyoming, and Texas. The United States agreed to pay Mexico $15 million in compensation and assumed certain debts owed by Mexico to American citizens. The Mexican-American War significantly expanded the territorial extent of the United States, contributing to the concept of manifest destiny and the idea of American exceptionalism. Most importantly for the Brewster Party, the Southern Trail now ran along the new border between the U.S. and Mexico and would take settlers through territory inhabited by several Native American tribes that had previous little to no contact with white folks and who were now competing with immigrants for resources on their own land. Fighting between Mexicans and Americans also meant that different tribes had been subjected to raids and massacres and formed alliances during the conflict, which shaped their view of white immigrants moving through their territory. Ella, I know you're going to ask what Manifest Destiny is, so here you go. I know what the fuck Manifest Destiny is. I know, I know, but I know, I already, when I was writing the script, I already knew when you were going to ask, you were like, we should talk about this here. Yes, you know. And I heard your voice going like, we should explain Manifest Destiny. Mm-hmm. I heard your voice in my head as I was trying to Yeah, say. you're right. I, uh, <laughs> I live with It's you. cute. It's, it's cute. Like <laughs> The doctrine of Manifest Destiny was a belief widely held by 19th century Americans, particularly during the period of westward expansion in the United States. It was a notion that expressed the idea that it was the destiny and duty of the American people to expand their nation from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean and to extend their political, social, and economic influence across the continent. The term Manifest Destiny was first coined by journalist John L. O'Sullivan in 1845 in an article advocating for the annexation of Texas. He wrote that it was America's manifest destiny to overspread the continent allotted by Providence for the free development of our yearly multiplying millions. What a guy. Uh, my skin crawls. Are you yeah. multiplying millions? Could we not? <laughs> yeah. So some key elements, beliefs associated with the doctrine of manifest destiny. God's will. Supporters of manifest destiny often saw the expansion of the United States as divinely ordained, a mission from God to spread American democracy, culture, and civilization across the continent. Superiority and exceptionalism. Many proponents believed in the inherent superiority and exceptionalism of the American people, culture, and institutions. They felt it was their duty to bring these values to less civilized peoples and territories. Civilized is in air quotes. Territorial expansion. The doctrine justified the acquisition of new territories through various means, including negotiation, purchase, and sometimes even military conquest. Sometimes even... <laughs> This expansionist mindset led to the annexation of Texas, the Oregon Trail migration, the Mexican-American War, and the acquisition of the Southwest through the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. Continental vision. The doctrine's advocates envisioned the United States stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific with a belief that the country's territorial expansion would be beneficial economically and strategically. And finally, the opposition. So while Manifest Destiny was widely supported by many Americans, it also faced criticism and opposition, particularly from those who were concerned about the spread of slavery into the newly acquired territories, as well as those who believed in respecting the sovereignty and rights of Native American populations. We're we're getting a feel for the Oatmans, right? So they're white immigrants. They're following a sect of an already kooky offshoot religion that has some beliefs around 
utopia and baptizing the dead and bringing the gospel to everybody and living by utopian ideals. And then you have a war going on and this new idea of manifest destiny and encouraging this kind of expansion and a very paternalistic view of the native peoples inhabiting those places. You've got conflicts with the trail they're taking literally being on the border of a war zone. Newly traveled, so that means there's not going to be a lot of amenities along the way. There's not going to be a lot of established trading spots. There's not going to be these things that would be with them had they taken the Oregon Trail or the California trail, for example. So there's a, there's a lot going on here in terms of the conflicts that are going to ensue. The concept of manifest destiny played a significant role in shaping American policies and actions during the 19th century, contributing to westward expansion and territorial growth of the United States. However, its implementation also resulted in conflicts with indigenous populations, neighboring countries, and debates over the expansion of slavery, because they're such stand-up folks. A lot of people don't realize that leading up to the Civil War, there was, I think it was Bloody Kansas, was that Kansas, I believe, was the the state where there were a lot of conflicts over who was going to get statehood and whether or not they were going to be pro abolition or pro slavery. And these conflicts got very violent. Neighbors, if they suspected that you were an abolitionist or that you just were not pro-slavery might come to your house and set it on fire. There was a lot of conflict. And so opening up all of these territories, slavery has been debated since its inception, but it was before it was had it really was starting to boil up. But what was making it come to a head was this expansion and people wanting to know if they were going to be able to take their slaves into these new territories, or if they did that, then their slaves would turn around and be freed. Right. So there are a lot of people with really vested interests and in very specific outcomes for their economic advancement, et cetera. Absolutely. It just all feels very Machiavellian. And because it's God's divine plan, Manifest Destiny says that God is compelling us to expand come hell or high water. And if anybody gets in our way, then it's our job to save them or kill them because, you know, God's plan. And when it's God's plan, then you can really do no wrong along the way because it's in service of God. And that's very chilling and it's something that is used a lot in history, but yeah. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So common sense should have guided the Brewster Party's decision on which trails to take and where to settle and given them pause before heading into a war zone, but they were being led by a now 21-year-old child revelator who thought he was a prophet of God. As if being 21 in and of itself isn't reason enough to be wary, throwing Jesus into the mix was a recipe for disaster. Spoiler alert, things aren't going to work out very well for the Brewster Party. Do we feel caught up on context? Absolutely. The first part of the trail was generally well tolerated by most travelers. From the banks of the Missouri River west, the weather was good, and most wagon trains were full of well-rested, excited travelers. The trains moved slowly, with horses or oxen mainly pulling the wagons full of supplies, with the family members walking alongside the train. At night, the wagons would be circled to enclose the animals that would be left to graze and rest throughout the night. People would play games, hunt, explore, tell stories, and sing. It usually took a while for good cheer to break down, and it usually happened as the wooded, hilly landscape gave way to endless, flat plains. At this point, the monotony of the journey would begin to set in. I'm imagining the drive from LA to Vegas, but like days and days and days. Yeah. No hygiene. So they would be going through Nebraska. Nebraska was, it's just a flat line to the horizon. And so there's nothing to look at. There's, I mean, there's just nothing. So I was reading Mark Twain's Roughing It, and he spends a lot of time talking about uh, just the psychological kind of intensity of that vast open space and how as a single young man, it was like really cool and exciting and like just amazing. But him going by himself or with a, I think it was with his brother. So it's like two young men going from carriage to carriage and staying in these one room little squat places. Very fun. Mm -hmm. But when you've got huge groups of families and some of these trains, I mean, would be like like hundreds of people and they've got their entire lives in these wagons and 
it's a different psychological kind of reality starting to set in, especially if you didn't get along with people. So you would join a, a wagon train and then the wagon train would form like an articles of incorporation almost. They would designate a leader and they would create rules. Mm -hmm for the journey so that it would hopefully mitigate any conflicts that might happen, obviously, when you're traveling with that many people that don't fucking know each other. Yeah. And there were a lot of reasons to be headed out west. So you could be a religious zealot, you could be a criminal, you could be a sex worker, you could. So you're dealing with people that are like very different walks of life, all grouped together. They would get in these big groups for the safety of the numbers, worrying about gambling, prostitution, adultery, you name it. It was the kind of conflicts that could happen. So they would create sort of like a rules of conduct. They would designate a train leader. Usually they would ha have maybe some kind of a security detail, some kind of military outfit guides, somebody that was sort of at the top sort of leading things, but they weren't like in charge. They were ushering the journey, but someone on the train was the mayor until they got where they were going and would make the command decisions. And so there were rules, but they were unique to each wagon train. It also was to prevent conflict over like too many cooks, right? You don't want to have too many cooks when you're having to make these big decisions about which direction you're going to take or if you're going to stay the night or you're going to keep going, stuff like that. So there, it was a way to kind of streamline those decisions, but it was very informal. Any real kind of structure or law and order, it was all very... Well, why we call things the Wild West, right? It, was, it sounds very human, very core human. You establish a social contract to keep people from killing each other, basically. You have yeah. someone appointed to oversee it that everybody likes enough to trust to put in that position. You have people to enforce it when it comes necessary. And hopefully everything functions well if everything, you know, works out. Right. The Brewster Party made it about 100 miles down the Santa Fe Trail before making camp at Council Rock. By the time the party had reached this place, they were already at each other's throats. Over what, it isn't clear, but apparently putting a bunch of religious zealots together doesn't make for much fun. At this point, several people in the party of 50 wanted to return home, but they were talked into staying the course. They made it to the Arkansas River before they had their first encounter with the natives. The party had made camp on the bank of the river, and one of the party had gone off to hunt antelope and encountered a group of Comanches who were celebrating. The hunter saw that they had all manner of livestock and that they had been stolen. One of the men saw him and approached, but the hunter ran back to camp. A little while later, the band appeared at their camp offering friendship, uh, and when after a while the Comanches started to convene with themselves and raise their bows and arrows, the settlers went for their guns, which was enough to scare them off. So why were they raising their bows? It's just where they just kind of like talk. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break in here to talk about the Comanche because native people are not a monolith and different tribes had different reputations and relationships with the settlers. So their first encounter with natives is one of their party goes off to hunt, encounters a group of Comanches celebrating over clearly stolen livestock. It scares him. Then he goes back to camp. The Comanches show up and are kind of making motions towards fr a friendship. And then when the settlers see that they're starting to like arm themselves and so they pulled out their guns, right? Like yeah. this was like, you know, I mean, people were sort of prepared for this. You didn't know who you were dealing with, what they wanted, because some native groups were friendly with settlers and some were very hostile to settlers. And most settlers didn't know enough about the native peoples to be able to differentiate the two. The Comanche are a Native American tribe that historically inhabited the Southern Plains region, primarily in present day Texas, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and Kansas. The Comanche were renowned as skilled horsemen and formidable warriors. They were a nomadic buffalo hunting society that adapted their lifestyle to the vast grasslands of the Southern Plains. The introduction of horses by the Spanish in the 17th century greatly transformed Comanche culture, enabling them to become highly mobile and expand their influence. During the 18th and 19th centuries, the Comanche became one of the dominant powers on the Southern Plains, controlling a vast territory and engaging in trade, warfare, and diplomacy with neighboring tribes and European settlers. They were known for their raiding parties and were often involved in conflicts with both Native American tribes and Euro-American settlers. Today, the Comanche Nation is federally recognized tribe with its headquarters in Oklahoma. 
So go ahead, Ella, continue. <laughs> a few days after this encounter with the Comanche, the Brewster party met a government train that told them they'd encountered another government train that had been raided by the Comanche, with most of their livestock taken and the members of the train with no means of getting home. The party was also informed that they were about to enter a hundred mile stretch of desert without any water reserves or resting places. The party was lucky, however, as they managed to pass this stretch of desert without much discomfort owing to several days of rain that reduced the heat and provided fresh water as they walked, which is very lucky. Yeah. <laughs> they made it 500 more miles before reaching Moro, the first settlement on the journey into New Mexico. And while nothing much happened during that time, the personalities of everyone in the party began to grate upon each other. It seems they couldn't stop bickering about different religious principles, and that Olive's father, Royce Oatman, was one of the worst. It seems he felt he was in competition with Brewster for the role of prophet. One man that traveled with the party said that if the party had to choose between smallpox or Royce Oatman, they would have all gladly contracted smallpox. You've got America's next top prophet going on while people are trying to fight like dysentery and... His wife is heavily pregnant with seven children. I can't begin to imagine. That dick game must have been strong because... Do you think he changed no. the angel diaper? No. I don't want to insult the... I can't give it away. I had a great fucking joke, but I'll have to save it till after we... Save it for the stage, darling. Save it. Ah. ah. The, the struggle is real. <laughs> So they stopped in several Mexican towns along the way and found they had good supplies of meat for trade. However, as they moved along the trail, there was less food to trade and the settlements were increasingly disheveled as they were nearing the sites of various battles during the Mexican-American War. When they reached the Forks, the party could choose between two roads to take them to the next settlement of Socorro. Brewster wanted to take the road that went through Santa Fe so he could check his mail. Oatman and a few others wanted to take the quicker route, so the party broke apart, with Oatman and a few families taking the shorter route and the others going with Brewster through Santa Fe. He had a newspaper to run, and like he needed to keep everyone updated on his journey to, you know, utopia. He had to publish or perish. <laughs> All right. So by the time both parties met again in Socorro, they were done traveling together. Brewster claimed that he'd had a new vision from God and that their utopian settlement should be built outside of Socorro, 600 miles closer than the land of Bashan, which was said to be at the confluence of the Colorado and Gila Rivers. The residents of Socorro encouraged the settlers to stay for a year until better weather, and Brewster and his followers agreed, forming the settlement of Colonia a few miles outside of the town. Oatman and a few other families decided to continue on alone to the promised land. It must be so tight to have a direct connection to God and be like, oh, shit. Y'all. And he always does what you want. <laughs> yeah. God said we had to be on the road by eight, but he just told me we can totally sleep until like 11. So hit me up later. <laughs> Super convenient. <laughs> Love it. I mean, it kind of reminds me of the story of Jay-Z Knight, where she fell in love with her husband, even though she was already married. But, you know, Ramtha told her that this was actually her destiny. It's amazing that everything she wanted, Ramtha wanted. It's Well, she just awesome. really devoted herself to Ramtha, you know. Yeah, she was following all the tenants. In mid-October, they reached the Rio Grande. The route led south through the Rio Grande Valley, then cut west into what would become Arizona, then hugged the Gila River, which at that time marked the U.S.-Mexico border, then cut northwest across the Colorado River at Yuma Crossing, where it merged with the Gila Trail. They were running out of supplies, and the Oatmans had two of their horses stolen in the night by natives. By November, they were moving through the mountains of northern Mexico, terrain that slowed them to half of their speed. Remember that time was money, so to speak, in terms of supplies. The more supplies you carried with you, the slower the animals moved, which meant the longer it took to get to where you're going, which meant the more supplies you needed, and on and on and on. They got stuck in the snow, people died, they were starving, and natives approached the camp daily until they woke up one morning to find that a dozen of their animals were missing. The Oatmans had to give up a wagon because they had no animals to pull it, which meant Royce, his wife Marianne, who was by now nearly due to have her eighth child, and his seven children were all confined to one wagon. Can you imagine? I don't even want to have one baby. Oh my God. I don't want to have a husband. I was and just can you imagine? That you're stuck with a husband 
and seven of those motherfuckers about to pop in one wagon hormones blasting the smells alone that must oh my god it must have been so miserable the morning sickness I, alone i could oh my god imagine. i cannot imagine put my, putting my family through this they didn't have to go they were farming this was one of those we're doing this for my ego we're doing this for my vainglory because i think i'm a prophet and i'm going to go be part of this new community where i'm going to be somebody and I think that was a lot of the fighting on the trip. He thought he was going to go on this journey and that he was going to like kind of push Brewster out. And the fact that people would have rather stayed with Brewster and like chose to go with him to Santa Fe, you, you just see why this probably blew up. So when the snow melted, they made their way to Santa Cruz, which had just suffered a winter drought and a raid by the Apache. They only had pumpkins to trade with the travelers. The Mexicans tried to convince them to stay, but they pushed forward and made it to Tucson by January. They stayed in Tucson for a month, and then the train split again. Five of the families decided to stay in Tucson and farm until more trains arrived, and three families decided to press on, led by Royce Oatman. Remember what we said about this is a war zone. It is not well-traveled. There is safety in numbers. They don't have supplies. This is the second time someone's been like, stay here and wait for better weather and for more people. Yeah. So Royce must have been charismatic enough or they must have been determined enough or whatever that two other families decided to go with him while the rest of the tramp was like, no, like we followed you this far, but like we're, we're kind of done, dude. Mm -hmm. Like this is this is getting a little crazy. They had the common sense to be like, this is like the second town that has said, like, you really, really don't want to keep going, like, until things get a little bit better. Yeah. So the Oatman party pressed on to Maricopa Wells, where shit got real, real shitty. Maricopa Wells was an important settlement and water source for the Maricopa people who are Native American inhabitants of the area. Maricopa Wells was a vital oasis in the arid desert landscape, providing a reliable water supply that sustained both the Maricopa people and travelers passing through the region. The site was situated along the Gila River, which served as a lifeline in the harsh desert environment. The Maricopa people used the water from the Gila River for drinking, irrigation, and supporting their agricultural activities. They cultivated crops such as corn, beans, and squash, which thrived in the fertile floodplain near Maricopa Wells. The water source also attracted other Native American tribes, traders, and travelers who utilized the site as a rest stop along their journeys. But after a drought, a hard winter, and an Apache raid, there wasn't much to trade. The other families in the party had finally had enough. They decided to stay in Maricopa Wells and farm until other wagon trains came through that they could join and trade with and ride with safely. Royce Oatman didn't want to wait any longer. At some point in the journey, he had decided that he was no longer interested in the promised land and instead wanted to travel all the way to California to mine for gold. Funny how quickly that happens when faith is tested. Wow. So basically, so they get to Maricopa. He's got two other families with him. They get there. And then those people are like, nah, dog. And this Maricopa is like not even looking that great. They've just been raided by a, a, a warring tribe. And there's already been like a really harsh winter. They normally have a lot of shit. They don't even have a lot of shit right now. So these last two families are like, fuck it. And this motherfucker goes, yeah, I think that me and my eight months pregnant wife and our seven kids should really do this by ourselves with no fucking supplies one wagon men's egos just never cease to amaze me it is crazy how the business of being a prophet goes hand in hand with extreme main character syndrome and that's yeah why everyone around him couldn't fucking stand him because people like that are insufferable like you'll follow okay listen my joke <laughs> you what my joke is <laughs> they didn't tell me till the end of the book that he was like five two <laughs> and i was like this all makes sense <laughs> That dick must have been a kickstand because <laughs> he's taking you across the country. He's knocked you up eight times. Like that dick must be huge. And he has the audacity to be short. I'm sorry. Pick a what? Cycle. Yeah. Like you can't do all. You can't do all of those. Oh, he's been dead a long time. I can make the joke. Okay. None of these people are still alive. 
spoiler alert, it takes place in 1845, like, like not 1850. They've, they've been gone a long time. Or they live on running their own little universes. <laughs> They're on the VR headset in the sky. <laughs> The Maricopa tried to warn the Oatman party off of traveling the Yuma Trail alone, but Royce decided to risk it anyway. Who can say what his motivation was? With a wife that was due any moment and seven motherfucking children, what would drive him to continue toward California when the safety of numbers was in Maricopa Wells? The Yuma Trail was basically a war zone at this point. The Yuma people had run a successful ferry business there, taking settlers across where the Gila and Colorado rivers met. Then an outlaw named John Glanton and his posse had taken it over and started their own lucrative business ferrying settlers themselves and sometimes killing them. In retaliation, the Yuma killed 15 men and scalped Glanton. The government retaliated back against the Yuma, called the Yuma Wars. Along the rough landscape and general lawlessness of the area, no one traveled it alone. An entomologist named LeConte had traveled from Fort Yuma to Maricopa Wells with a Mexican guide to collect samples. While at the wells, LeConte said that he hadn't encountered any native presence and thought the journey would be safe enough. Royce, in all his wisdom, decided that a fellow settler knew the land better than the Maricopa that warned him against it. Confirmation bias. Hell of a yeah. The Oatmans headed out on the Yuma Trail toward Fort Yuma. At this point, they had one wagon and weakened livestock to pull it. They had been traveling for seven months. They'd been traveling for seven months. Jesus. This journey was supposed to take, I think, three. Wow. They'd been traveling for seven months and were exhausted on their last reserves of food. While on the trail, they were overtaken by LeConte and his guide on their way back to Fort Yuma. Royce gave LeConte a letter to give to the captain at the fort, stating that the family was going to starve and needed assistance. The next day, LeConte and his guide were duped by a pair of natives that befriended them, then stole their horses. They had to continue the hundred or so miles to Fort Yuma on foot. Not wanting to double back and lose time, LeConte tacked a note to a tree warning the Oatmans of the native presence, and then he continued on to the fort. By the time LeConte made it back to Fort Yuma, nearly the entire Oatman family was already dead. It didn't matter much, as the captain at the fort received Royce's letter asking for help and simply ignored it until news of the massacre reached him. Wow. It's certain that Royce did find LeConte's note warning of hostile natives in the area, but he must have ignored it because he didn't have many other choices or he would have rather risked making it to Fort Yuma than trying to make it back to Maricopa Wells. 100 miles from Fort Yuma, their destination, the Oatmans reached the confluence of the Gila and Colorado Rivers, the so-called Land of Bashan, which was neither wooded, temperate, nor utopian. It was just flat desert, and while the Brewsterites called it Eden, the locals called it Schitt's Creek, and they were up it without a paddle. The Oatmans tried to get their animals across the Gila River, but the weakened animals struggled through the three feet of water, so they made camp on an island in the middle of the river surrounded by quicksand. That night, after they put the children to bed, Royce cried through the night, his children secretly listening. The next day, they forded the river and ascended a limestone mesa by breaking down the wagon and hand-carrying everything up to the bluff. After they finished, they looked out and saw nothing but more desert as far as the eye could see. They sat down for lunch, and as they finished up, they heard a noise. A group of 19 Yavapai, did I say that correctly? I think so. Approached them from down the hill. The Yavapai weren't known for raiding, but there had been a drought, then a hard winter, and the war in the preceding years had brought interlopers into the land, dipping into their reserves. Tough time. I think we know where, I think we know where this is headed. Yeah. The Yavapai, also known as the Wipukepa or Kuevkapaya, are a Native American tribe that historically inhabited the central and western parts of present-day Arizona in the United States. The name Yavapai translates to people of the sun or people of the west. The Yavapai were traditionally semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers with their culture and way of life shaped by the diverse landscapes of the region, including deserts, mountains, and forests. They relied on gathering wild plants, hunting game, and fishing in rivers and streams for sustenance. Their social organization was based on small family groups and bands led by a headman or a chief. The Yavapai were friendly with the Apache, Comanche, and Yuma, and Mojave, and enemies of the Maricopa and Pima peoples. While they weren't known for raiding, they hadn't taken to horses like the Apache and Comanche, they were considered fierce warriors. 
they helped the Yuma in their fight against the U.S. military and the Glanton gang over that ferry, but they were relatively unknown to settlers because they had avoided nearly all contact with white travelers. The Yavapai asked the Oatmans for food, and Royce refused, explaining that his family would starve if he gave away any of their food. It only took a few minutes to grab 14-year-old Olive and her 7-year-old sister Marianne and bludgeon the rest of the family to death. Wow. Fuck. I think this is a good time to break for part two. Yeah, Royce really, I mean, he died kind of by his own hand. By his own hubris and and pigheadedness and willfulness and utter disregard for the well-being of anybody but his fucking dream. Uh, So I've read her original captivity narrative, which was largely ghostwritten by a preacher, but we'll get into that in part two. It's not clear what the fighting was about. I think people didn't want to speak ill of the dead. I think there were a lot of reasons why it wasn't exactly clear, like what the conflicts were in that wagon train. But what was clear in everything was that the conflicts were almost immediate and that Royce was the thrust of it. And based on the decisions that he made time and again, it seems like his family really was at the whim of his ambitions. Absolutely. He's a farmer. He's got a dry goods store. Now they're in Chicago. Now they're back out on a farm. Now they're going to go find the land of Bashan. Now they're going to take this route. Now, you know, I mean, it just seems like everything was like sacrificed at the pyre of his ambition. Which was constantly shifting. Like his goals were constantly shifting. I mean, at what point did he decide they were going to go to California and strike it rich? What gold mining? Right. So it starts out as a religious, zealous movement, which I guess could be maybe more forgiven because you're caught up in the fever dream of spiritual utopia and cult-like aspect to the very, you know, the same thing about QAnon or anything else, being caught up in the fervor of feeling like you're part of a moment or a movement or the truth, the way and the light, and you, you're you exceptional in some way. And that devolving really quickly into, fuck it, we're just going to go to California and strike gold. And here's the thing, you weren't going to strike gold. I mean, that was also a huge gamble. It wasn't just like, let's go to Kansas and have a farm there and we'll just get a lot more land and they'll give it to us free because the government's trying to encourage us to move out there. No, it had to be, we're going to to find a utopia. We're, okay, we're going to go mine gold. Like, it couldn't be something simple. It was main character syndrome and it had to be some exceptionalism. And it's like this narcissistic, almost, you can't do anything the easy way. Everything has to come from struggle, but when it's convenient to do so. Yeah. You see this in a lot of like megalomaniacal YouTubers and and people today still the same sort of weird, I don't know, fervor. That's exactly what it was, was fervor. People were caught up in a fervor when all of those territories were suddenly opened up to U.S. expansion. And there was this big push by the government, this idea of manifest destiny. People really felt like everything was coming to them, that they were on the horizon of something new and amazing and magical. And it was theirs for the taking. And it was a huge shift culturally. So with the Industrial Revolution and not the Industrial Revolution, but well, no, was this tech? When, when do we when do we say the Industrial Revolution started? Uh, it's like 1860 something is when the transcontinental railroad, like that final gold spike is like driven in and like now it's riven, right? That there's a train can start in New York and end in in Seattle it, it's or in Los Angeles, right? Like we've we've done it. We did it. We, we, we crossed the whole thing. Anyone can get anywhere yes. all by rail. So as people moved away from agrarian life and started moving into cities, class disparity became a very painful and urgent part of daily life. And cities were crowded. There was a lot of disease. There had been a sense of loss from living off the land. There was this sense that you could ascend socially only so much. You could not escape your station in life. The class consciousness was emerging. The appeal of the West was if you were born in humble circumstances, if you weren't of a high class family, if you didn't have an education and all of this stuff, 
if you could get up enough money to get your shit together and get on a wagon and go out west, you could become anything you wanted. You could escape these class differences, essentially. That was the promise of the West for a lot of people. That's why a lot of sex workers went out there because the law in the West was whether you're a man or a woman, it didn't matter. If you could make it, if you could rough it, you could do anything you wanted. And so you had sex workers starting brothels and then turning around and running a chain of brothels and becoming very industrious businesswomen. And they were allowed to do that because the rule in the West was if you can handle your shit, you can do whatever you want. And they were you know, the fr- offering a lot to the communities and in a lot of cases, central like hubs for things like what healthcare, I think, amongst other things. Um, I mean, to some degree, yeah, because they were the only female presence. So, you know, they, it was, it was on them to sort of tend to the sick. And so, yeah, they, there was a lot of that. One of the women that ended up taking care of Olive when she returned to settler society for the couple of weeks that she was at the fort was a, a madam that ran a brothel across the river. That was a big reason that women wanted to go out there. It was freedom. I mean, the first woman who could ever vote was in Montana. I believe it was in it was in Montana or Wyoming. When they got their statehood, they allowed women the right to vote. So it wasn't the federal right to vote, but the very first person that could vote was I think it was in Billings, Montana, was they they got statehood and they gave women the right to vote. It was this old grandma that was the first woman to ever vote in the United States. It was in like the 1860s. And How did you vote though? Because like maybe fuck her anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably libertarian, yeah. I'm guessing. Yeah. The West was this place where you kind of, there was the, the real allure of it was you could kind of do anything you wanted. It was a way to escape your class, your station in life when the, the the ability to do that seemed to have dried up in the cities. Yeah. And it was becoming apparent that if you were born poor, you were going to die poor and there wasn't much you could do about it. Mm-hmm. And then suddenly it was like, but if you go out West, there's no one there, but you can have like 50 acres of land. And then if you farm it and you do it right, then you could own a couple of farms and then maybe you could have this and then you could build up this and you could be the mayor of a town. You could start your own town. You could name it after yourself. It was really attractive to a certain type of person. And it was someone that wanted to make something of themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think Royce fell into that category. People that wanted to make something of themselves, people that wanted freedom, religious freedom, and then people that were like on the run from the law for some reason. But I think he fell into that category of someone that had a vision for how his life was going to go and that he wanted to be part of something special. I think there's a reason he responded to that ad, you know, and not some other general ad that was just looking for people to join a wagon train. It it had to be a wagon train that was going to establish the new utopia, you know? Yeah. So nothing less than exceptional. Yeah. That is the end of part one. And part two, we will get into what happens next because that this is very tragic, but what happens next is really kind of incredible. It's It's very, very unlike any other captivity story. It's really special. She had a very unique experience. Hell yeah. (laughs) Okay, I think we're good. I think we did. Hi, guys. It's Sovereign Sire here uh, in the editing booth. And I have a few corrections to make to today's episode. There were a few points where I misspoke or there was some confusion. And I'm here with answers. So early in the podcast, I said captivity narratives were as old as the Bible. They're actually older than that. They're as old as stories. So that was the first thing I want to get out of the way. Um, The second thing is me and Ella were having a discussion about where the phrase as above, so below comes from. It actually comes comes from the ninth century from a text called the Emerald Tablet. It was co-opted by the occult movement with Madame Blavatsky. It is a sentiment that is also echoed in the Bible. If you look at the Lord's Prayer on earth as it is in heaven is basically a paraphrase. The idea was that things that happened in the celestial heavens uh, directly impacted things that happened down on earth. As a concept, it is both occult and Christian and oldest time. Also in 
the episode, I was a little unsure about the dates of the Industrial Revolution. It is considered to have started from around 1760 to about 1840. So that aligns with when the migrations to the West also started happening. So as soon as people were leaving agrarian life and going into the cities, they were leaving the cities and trying to get back out into the wilderness and back to a kind of agrarian way of life. Also, we were discussing the railroads, and I said that somewhere around the 1760s was when the Transcontinental Railroad was completed. It began construction in 1863 and was completed in 1869. And that is when both railroads coming from the east and west met together. And they actually drove a golden spike into the railroad to commemorate the event. And finally, I was talking about the first woman that was able to legally vote. And I said it was in Wyoming or Montana. It was in Wyoming. And this is from history.com. In 1869, William Bright, a saloon keeper and president of the Upper House of the Wyoming Territory introduced a bill granting all female residents 21 years and older the right to vote. According to the Wyoming State Historical Society, the territorial legislature had already passed progressive measures guaranteeing women teachers the same pay as men and granting married women property rights apart from their husbands. Bright's measure, backing universal women's suffrage, however, would be groundbreaking in the United States. The bill passed both houses of the all-male legislature and was signed into law on December 10th. 1869 by Republican Governor John Campbell. The following September, the 69-year-old Louisa Swain, described by a local newspaper as a gentle and white-haired housewife, became the first woman to cast a ballot under the law in her town of Laramie, Wyoming. There was no protest. Quote, there was too much good sense in our community for any jeers or sneers to be seen on such an occasion, unquote, reported the Laramie Sentinel. The new law also allowed women to serve on juries and hold public office. Esther Morris became Wyoming's first female justice of the peace in 1870, and she tried more than 40 cases during her tenure. Why was this sparsely populated territory on the rough edges of the frontier in the vanguard of women's rights? While Bright and others believed in ideals of gender equality, the Wyoming State Historical Society says there were other factors as well. In a territory where men outnumbered women by six to one ratio, some hoped the publicity from the measure might attract single women to Wyoming to rectify the gender imbalance, as well as to help it achieve the population threshold required to apply for statehood. Politics also played a role as some Democratic legislators hoped the bill would put the Republican governor in a tough spot. If Campbell, whose party championed African-American voting rights, vetoed the measure, he would look hypocritical. If it passed, Democrats thought women voters would reward them for introducing the measure. And that is all I have for corrections for this episode. See you guys next week.